please welcome the President of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, Stephen Orlins. Secretary Kissinger, is this on? <laughs> Secretary Kissinger, Secretary Geithner, Secretary Chow, Ambassadors Xie, Huang, Hills, All Stars, Yao Ming, and Tracy McGrady. <laughs> what a night! What a night. Thank you all for coming. It's really terrific to see everybody. Let me share an experience I had recently. At the invitation of Ambassador Xie, I gave a toast at the National Day reception for the Chinese Embassy. As I often do, I used a quote, and in this one, I said, U.S.-China relations reminds me a bit of a quote I learned in college from Chairman Mao. 我们的同志在困难的时候要看到成绩要看到光明要提高我们的勇气 For those who didn't get that, friends, in times of difficulty, look at our record Look at the bright side and boost up our courage. After the media published the video, it went viral in China, receiving hundreds of thousands of likes and was viewed by hundreds of millions of people. Every meeting I had in China last week started with the, my friend or the official telling me, I was an internet sensation. <laughs> While I won't be leaving my day job to become an internet influencer anytime soon, this brief moment of notoriety reminded me that the bonds connecting average Americans and Chinese remain strong. It also reminded me that the work that the work the National Committee does of connecting peoples in both countries is invaluable. Let's just discuss the quote and see why this has become viral. During times of difficulty, we should look at our accomplishments, which in the last half century in Asia has been peaceful for the first time in the last 100 years. Yao Kan Dao Guangming, look at the bright side. Relations are actually improving for the first time in a very, very long time. And we very much hope that our two presidents will meet within the month. I'm just back from China, as I said before, and I can unequivocally say that the Chinese government is looking for ways to improve. U.S.-China relations. And finally, boost up our courage. We should be unafraid to speak up for education, for expertise, and for the benefits that a constructive U.S.-China relationship has brought to the people of America and the people of China. With our dedicated staff, our committed board, and programs too numerous to name, we at the National Committee have persevered in this difficult time, and our efforts are beginning to pay off. Over the last two days, you can see many of the people in this room attended a people-to-people -people conference which celebrated the people-to-people -people ties between our two countries and discussed how we can rebuild them in this new era. After dinner, 
we will hear from NBA All-Stars Yao Ming and Tracy McGrady about how important those ties are and how they make our world better and safer. We could only do what we do with the support of every single person in this room. I want to especially thank the Star Foundation. I want to thank Chubb and Evan Greenberg, Citadel and Peng Zhao, Fulgent Genetics and Mingxie, X Cole and Ernie Thrasher, and the Dalio Philanthropies for their extraordinary support. Our staff, especially Meredith Mastrella, Jan Barris, Alex Guido, Oshin Hennigan, Zachary Zablonis, have made this effort the great success that it is. As a result of their efforts and the support from every one of you, I am proud to announce that this year we have raised over $2.865 million. Two million eight hundred and sixty-five thousand. Of course, we are here tonight to honor the man who has contributed more to U.S.-China relations than any American, Dr. Henry Kissinger. At At this point, I would introduce our chairman, Jack Liu, who's the nominee to be America's ambassador to Israel. Unfortunately, Jack came down with COVID, so he decided not to infect us all and stayed home. But he did ask me to read a letter to Dr. Kissinger. Dear Henry, my warm thanks to you for being here tonight and for your ongoing support for the committee. I regret deeply that I am not able to be with you, but I returned from my confirmation hearing at the end of last week and tested positive for COVID. So attending was simply not an option. Your leadership in foreign affairs is legendary. But here tonight, we also celebrate your partnership and mentorship that continues each time we meet. The views you share at our board meetings, that's the National Committee board meetings, and your private counsel adds so much, both in terms of insight and analytical rigor. The time you make in your busy schedule for these sessions is a constant reminder of your commitment to the work we do and how important it is. On a personal note, you have been a teacher to so many of us who followed you in working on US-China relations. As I prepared for my first trip to China as Secretary of the Treasury, our private conversations helped me understand how to launch my engagement at that critical moment and contributed greatly to my ability to play a constructive role. And I hear similar stories from so many others who have served in a wide variety of roles. As I prepare to embark on a new mission to serve as U.S. Ambassador to Israel, if confirmed, I hope once again to call on you for your counsel during these difficult days. Congratulations on this recognition tonight and my very best personal wishes. Sincerely, Jacob L. Liu. So now let me turn it over to another of our nation's great public servants, America's 75th Secretary of the Treasury, Tim Geithner, who will present tonight's award. Serving under President Bob Biden, no, President Obama, Secretary Geithner took office in the midst of the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression and helped design and lead the successful strategy to avert global economic collapse and repair the damage to the U.S. economy and the financial system. We thank him for his service 
and we greatly appreciate him stepping in at the last moment tonight. Let me turn it over to Secretary Geithner. Thank you, Steve. Uh, nice to see you all here tonight. It's my great pleasure, a real personal honor for me, to join you here tonight to honor Dr. Henry Kissinger. Dr. Kissinger has been the dominant intellect and statesman of US foreign policy for well over half a century. He came to Washington to serve as national security advisor to President Nixon at a dangerous time in international relations, a time of war with the balance of forces shifting around the world. His judgments during those years and as Secretary of State played a decisive role in shaping an international order that helped bring about a period of relative stability and rising economic achievement for much of the world. Tonight, we recognize Dr. Kissinger for his foundational contributions to the U.S.-China relationship. In 1971, of course, Dr. Kissinger made his now famous secret trip to China via Pakistan. That same year, the National Committee helped facilitate the initial exchanges known as ping-pong diplomacy. President Nixon's visit in 1972 laid the foundation for the normalization of diplomatic ties and five decades of engagement, exchanges of students and scholars, deeper economic integration, and cooperation on a broad range of common international challenges. This 50-year period of deepening U.S.-China relations has not been without tension and complexity. It has not been a straight line of improving trust and mutual confidence. The improvements were not inevitable. What Dr. Kissinger and the leaders of China demonstrated, and the ideal the National Committee has helped promote, is that diplomacy, a sustained effort to listen and to try to understand, not just at the highest levels of government, but across all elements of civil society, can help overcome great differences in history, in politics, in culture, and perspective. Dr. Kissinger's legacy and the work of the National Committee had a huge personal impact on my own life. I started in China in the summers of 1981 and 1982 on one of the first student programs made possible by Dr. Kissinger's statecraft. I worked for Dr. Kissinger for three years in my first job after graduate school. I spent 25 years in U.S. economic policy working with a remarkably talented mix of Chinese economic policy leaders, many of them friends of Dr. Kissinger. One of the things I admire most about him is his recognition that to protect the interests of one's own country, you have to try to see the world through the eyes of the people and the leaders of other countries, to understand their histories and how they perceive their interests. Since his secret trip, Dr. Kissinger has continued to serve as an invaluable bridge between the US and China. His books and essays have influenced generations of policymakers in both countries, leaders from both China and the United States and many other countries regularly turn to him for counsel. Dr. Kissinger has been a long supporter of the mission of the National Committee. We are fortunate to have benefited from that support and to still be able to benefit from his wisdom and active engagement. So we honor him tonight for his decades of work in helping foster friendship between the US, between the Chinese and American people, and in working towards a framework in which the US and China can coexist peacefully and cooperate on many of the challenges the world faces. So the committee presents with him tonight the China-U.S. Friendship Cup, made by the renowned Beijing Enamel Factory. Please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Kissinger to the stage. Tim, thank you for your kind words. Working for me is not an easy task. 
and I was afraid he might accuse me of a human rights violation. <laughs> so, I have spent literally half of my life working on Chinese-American relations. Um, and I did so. I like the Chinese people. I am impressed by Chinese culture, but in the positions that I have had, I have to look at the American interests. And I am convinced that Chinese-American relations depend on an understanding that the two countries have a unique ability to bring peace and progress to the world. And they also have a unique ability to destroy the world if they are not together. This is the necessity <clears throat> that I see. And let me put it into four categories. One, the basic relationship between China and the United States. Second, the issue of Taiwan. Third, the war in the Ukraine. And fourth, the advanced, advancing technology, which could by itself drive the nations into conflict. <clears throat> I believe now, as I believe 50 years ago, that we can find our way through these difficulties. When the two presidents meet in San Francisco, as I hope they will, I hope that they will find words to express the reality that they are devoted to peace with each other and that they will make every effort to avoid it and create institutions which permit us to talk to each other at the highest level, easily and continuously. With respect to Taiwan, I was present when the agreement, the Shanghai Agreement, was made. So we in America have to avoid giving the impression 
that we are walking away from the one China concept to which we committed ourselves. And I was there at the drafting of it. So that was a real commitment. In the Shanghai communique, we express the American conviction that this goal should be reached by peaceful means. To both sides have a marker towards which they can move. In the war in Ukraine, China had so far not committed itself, and the United States as not criticized China for its conduct. And finally, <clears throat> I want to say a word about technology. The danger lies not in what the two statesmen do, right away, but in technology itself. And in the danger that we decouple ourselves totally from China in this enterprise. The reason this concerns me is because in nuclear weapons, they can be counted and the aspects may be known. But artificial intelligence is in the minds of people and so, certain restraints should now be agreed to in the near future before we are driven by our technology into a conflict that we should not want. And all of this amounts to my conviction that a peaceful relationship, a cooperative relationship between China and the United States is essential for peace and progress in the world. And I've given you these examples not as a policy statement because that would require a much longer discussion, but as an expression of what this committee has stood for in all its existence. And we have contributed to this evolution. And I'm confident that all of you here will agree that peace 
and braggarts between China and the United States is in the self-interest of each country and in the interest of the world. Thank you for asking me to come here and make a few remarks. All the best in this effort that this committee has made and that all of you, I hope, are devoted to. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Kissinger, and thanks to all of you for giving uh, Dr. Kissinger the the warm embrace and celebration he deserves. Um, I have the privilege now of reading a letter from the President of the United States of America to the National Committee on, on U.S.-China Relations. So a letter from President Biden. I send my rock my warmest greetings to everyone gathered for the 2023 National Committee on U.S.-China Relations Gala Dinner. For 57 years, your organization has brought together officials, experts, and members of civil society to foster greater conversation and cooperation on a wide range of issues between the, United, between the U.S. and China. My administration is committed to maintaining this cooperation especially on issues where the progress hinges on our common efforts. Both China and the U.S. have a duty to address transnational challenges that affect the lives of our peoples, including strengthening global food and health security, combating the climate crisis, and countering narcotics trafficking. America will also continue to responsibly manage the competition between our countries as we advance our mutual vision for a free, open, secure, and prosperous world. And we remain committed to partnering with any nation that shares our devotion to protecting the international institutions and rules of the road that have helped safeguard global security and prosperity for decades. I am grateful for the National Committee's long-standing work supporting critical channels of dialogue and debate between the US, China, and countries around the world. May you continue to promote peace and stability for many years to come. I have the, pr the pleasure now of uh, welcoming a friend of the National Committee and the Ambassador of the People's Republic of China to the United States of America, Ambassador Xie. Thank you. Dr. Kissinger, Secretary Geithner, President Orleans, ladies and gentlemen, good evening everyone. It is a great pleasure to attend the Gala Dinner 2023 of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations and get together with friends, old and new. First, I have the honor to read the congratulatory letter from His Excellency Xi Jinping, President of the People's Republic of China. Chair Lu and President audience, friends, on the occasion of your gala dinner 2023, 
I wish to extend my appreciation to the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations and its members for the long-time commitment to promoting exchanges and cooperation in all fields between the two countries. I also wish to congratulate Dr. Henry Kissinger on being recognized as this year's honoree. The Chinese people will always remember his historic contribution to China-U.S. relations. As two major countries in the world, whether China and the United States can find a right way to get along with each other bears on world peace and development and the future of humanity. China is ready to work with the United States in the three principles of mutual respect, peaceful coexistence, and win-win cooperation. To advance mutually beneficial cooperation, properly manage differences, jointly address global challenges, and to help each other succeed and prosper together to the benefit of both countries as well as the world. I hope that the National Committee and friends from all sectors will continue to care for and support China-U.S. relations and play a constructive role in facilitating the sound and steady development of our bilateral relations. Xi Jinping, President, the People's Republic of China. Well, ladies and gentlemen, in the congratulatory letter, President Xi commended the National Committee and Dr. Kissinger for their important contribution to promoting China-U.S. relations. He expounded on the necessity and significance of finding a right way for China and the United States to get along with each other and reiterated China's goodwill for a sound and stable China-U.S. relationship. President Xi noted in the letter, as two major countries in the world, whether China and the United States can find a right way to get along with each other bears on world peace and development and the future of humanity. Today, our two countries are again at a crossroads. The course of history will be shaped by whether we can draw inspiration from the past, seize the opportunities at present, and find a right way forward to create a brighter future. Throughout the history, China-U.S. relations have kept moving forward on the whole. The past half a century and more have witnessed the China-U.S. relationship forging ahead against all the odds. Today, our two-way trade and investment stand at 760 billion U.S. dollars and 240 U.S. dollars, billion U.S. dollars, respectively. Over 70,000 American companies are doing business in China, and the United States has invested in nearly 80,000 projects in China. Trade between, the, between us has supported more than 2.6 million jobs in the United States. Before the pandemic, 3 million Chinese tourists visit United States annually, contributing over 30 billion U.S. dollars. While a lot has changed in the overall context and both our countries, the historic logic underlying this growth of the China-U.S. relationship has not changed. 
the importance of the relationship for our respective development and world prosperity is not to be underestimated. The aspiration of our peoples for peace and friendship is not to be dismissed. And the efforts of generations of peoples and our extensive common interests are not to be denied. While China-U.S. relations will not return to the past, it does not mean we should start all over again, still less turning back the wheel of history. What we should do is to build on the joint efforts by generations of leaders, including Dr. Kissinger, and peoples with vision in both countries learn from history and forge into the future. At present, stabilizing China-U.S. relations is a common aspiration. Recently, our two countries have had a series of high-level interactions. China has resumed group tours to the United States. Direct flights will increase to 48 every week. Dialogue and exchanges between the think tanks, provinces and states, and the legislature are on the rise. These positive signs of a more stable China-U.S. relationship have been welcomed by various communities in our two countries, as well as the international community. If we can learn anything from the ups and downs in China-U.S. relations over the past few years, it is that conflict between China and the United States should never be allowed. Decoupling will never work. Cold War confrontation will lead nowhere. Reversing the downward spiral is a shared wish, and messing up this relationship serves no one's interest. Meanwhile, serious difficulties and grave challenges still abound. But to our encouragement, supporters of exchanges and cooperation between China and the United States are never absent. Friends from the U.S. business and the strategic communities have been visiting China, calling for seizing China's opportunities and further tapping its market. A few days ago, I made a trip to Muscatine, the city President Xi Jinping first visited in 1985. I am more convinced that the hope and foundation of China-U.S. relationship lie in the people, and its future lies in the youth. It is the warm-hearted, hard-working, and open-minded American people, just like those of Iowa, who define what America truly is. Going forward, we need to find a right way for China and the United States to get along in the new era. We will be celebrating the 45th anniversary of the establishment of China-U.S. diplomatic ties next year. The China-U.S. relationship will continue to be the most important bilateral relationship in the world. Neither side can transform or displace the other. It is China's consistent belief that our two countries should be partners, not rivals. That we should pursue win-win game or win-win outcomes, not zero-sum game. And that we should together show the stabilize and improve this relationship not allow it to slide into conflict or confrontation. The three principles outlined by President Xi Jinping, namely mutual respect, peaceful coexistence, and win-win cooperation, represent our long-term and fundamental approach 
to China-U.S. relations and provide a guideline for in exploring the path forward. Among these, the most important thing is that we should respect each other's core interests, and among which Taiwan and other questions that are important and sensitive should be handled in a prudent way in accordance with the uh, One China principle as well as the three joint communiques between China and the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, the famous Chinese writer, more high-level interactions are underway. In two days, Foreign Minister Wang Yi will visit the United States. We hope the U.S. side will work with China in the same direction, shorten the negative list, expand the positive agenda, and bring China-U.S. relations back to the right track of sound and stable growth. Ladies and gentlemen, the famous Chinese writer Lu Xun wrote in the 1920s that there was no road in the world at the start. Just when many people walked by, a road was hence formed. President Abra Abraham Lincoln said, always bear in mind that you, your own resolution to succeed is more important than any other one thing. The growth of China-U.S. relations could not be achieved without the strategic guidance of our leaders, nor will it be achieved without the participation and support by people from various communities in both countries. The National Committee is a committed advocate of China-U.S. cooperation. Dr. Kissinger is a trailblazer and ice breaker. Let me take this opportunity to again extend my warm congratulations to Dr. Kissinger for being this year's honoree. Thank you. This is a moment that again calls for the strategic courage to break out of the cocoon, the wisdom of diplomacy to seek common ground while reserving differences, and the commitment the distinguished generation has shown us who has visited the, uh, while reserving differences, and the commitment the distinguished centenarian has shown us who has visited China more than 100 times, including one after his 100th birthday. <laughs> I count on the National Committee and all our friends here to continue playing a leading role in restoring China-U.S. relations back to the right track. Together, let us explore a path of win-win cooperation between China and the United States for the benefits of both peoples and the world. Thank you very much.
Beach, National Committee President Stephen Orlins, Tracy McGrady, and Yao Ming. So I'll be on the far. Okay. All right, thank you. I'm going to remain standing so I can be as tall as these guys when they're sitting. Wow, what a night. Have Henry Kissinger and then Yao Ming and Tracy McGrady. It's as good as it gets. It's what a pleasure to be able to share the stage with two NBA All-Stars, what, seven times for you and eight times for you, Yao? Is that right? I lost, I lost You lost I track. It was... It, if I named all the awards that these guys won, I wouldn't have, we wouldn't have time for this discussion. Uh, this summer, I visited the uh, Olympic Museum in Switzerland, and they had a quote from Jesse Owens, the famous American uh, athlete who won four gold medals in track in the 1936 um, Olympics. He said, friendship born on the field of athletic strife are the real gold of competition. Awards become corroded. Friends gather no dust. The two of you come from entirely different backgrounds, yet you, your friendship, represents exactly what Jesse Owens was, talk about, was talking about. Can you talk about how your friendship developed? Well, we were teammates. Um, is my mic on? Mike, one sec. You can hear me? Okay. Oh, sorry about that. Um, so I, I um, had my four years in Orlando, and after that four year, it was a very frustrating season. And I was looking to, uh, you know, at that time, basketball in the NBA was about um, a wing player and a big man. And at that time, you had the Shaq and Kobe, you had Tony Parker and, and, and Tim Duncan. And then you had this guy right here to my left who was young, trying to find his way in the league, but you saw the potential. And for me, I figured if, you know, I could go team up with him, you know, maybe we can, you know, do something special in the NBA as being teammates. And uh, from the first day, I mean, you know, what can I say? I, I've already had relationships with China by going since I, it was 1998. It was my first time. And every year I just kept going. So I uh, was familiar with the culture. And when we became teammates, I mean, you know, it was really just colliding those, those uh, culture differences together. And, you know, basketball for us is, you know, we're very passionate about it. And uh, it, it brought us together on the court and also off the court. But the, I, I realized how big this really was between us two when we were a part of the first Asian Games in 2005. And that was a joy to be a part of. From your perspective, yeah. Actually, that's 2004. OK, all right. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> um, well, for me, um, well, I remember a movie. Um, that actually reminds me of a movie. You remember that uh, movie talk about you know, a legendary uh, baseball guy, uh, um, Jackie Robinson? Yeah. 42? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, after I watched that movie, I think it's, it's like a coaching shock, culture shock mm -hmm. in there. Um, obviously, for me, as a you know, Chinese player who joined the NBA, I don't want to say that, but especially in Texas, you know, <laughs> that that uh, um, now I I thought I prepared everything, you know, I, I, before I I came to uh, uh, before I um, I came to Rocket, come to Houston, that I, I try to study some English, some of our, our books to learn something about how I can survive in this league right there. Um, but suddenly, when you're running into a bunch of a teammate like this, especially like 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 teammate, that uh, you still not you're never preparing enough 
feel you're never preparing enough. I remember the first practice when I practiced, officially I practiced with him. You know, you, we were being forbidden practice together before the training camp start. That's a, uh, that's a league policy or something, mm -hmm. all right? It's, uh, it's last, ha last thing has happened on, on court. Something is really off the record. <laughs> it's really, <laughs> really off the record, but, uh, um, but you know, basketball is a sport that can, can put us together. Regarding uh, those uh, misunderstanding of a language, because be honestly, I'm not perfectly, I'm not perfectly speak English until today. You're not speaking the Chinese at all. You speak a lot. You, you, <laughs> you speak, you're a lot better. Than but I learned there. trash you, talk from you. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, you did a great like job. Like the one I just gave to yes. you. <laughs> yes. You trash talk, and, and, Tracy? And, and, uh, just a little bit. And I had to learn. <laughs> but it wasn't reciprocated, though. I had to learn trash talk from my Chinese teammates and not Yao. So, you know, I helped you out. You didn't help me out when I went to CBA, I, but I, I try. Cool. Well, I try to keep my advantage. Huh? Okay. All right. So, what, ye what year was that? That, that you then went, how long were you in the Rockets before you joined, or was it simultaneous? You came well, in 2002? Yeah, I joined the team in 2002. And what year did that you was join? 2004, 2005. So you operated without Tracy for a few years, but it wasn't as much fun. Oh, that's fun. <laughs> also fun. Oh, come on. One of the great moments you know, I attended the opening of the, uh, of the Olympics on August 8th, 2008. And watching you, Yao, lead the Chinese team with the Chinese flag on one side and holding the hand of a nine-year-old boy on the other who had been a hero in the Wenchuan earthquake. What did that, I mean, the whole world was watching. What did that feel like? Well, uh, well, uh, there's a, uh, about two months ago, um, there's another uh, um, guy asked me the same question, which is, is just so to me. I, 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 I suddenly, I don't know where this answer came from. It's also from another movie, you know? It's like, Watch remember, movies, uh, yeah. I, I, I learned my English from, from those movies. <laughs> um, <laughs> Titanic, remember that movie, Titanic from? I think we all watched Titanic. Yeah. yeah. You want to sing, sing a song? You just watched that? You just, you just <laughs> don't mention another movie. I'm not. <laughs> okay. Um, at the very end, remember that old rose he said. I said I don't have, I don't even have a picture of him. He only exists in my memory. You know, when you just ask me how I feel about the 2008 Olympics, it's exactly the same feel. That I cannot explain how I feel about it, but it only res res uh, exists in my, in my memory. You That's how I feel. It wasn't a deeply emotional moment. In other words, I keep a tape of the 2008 Winter Olymp uh, the Olympic highlights because it's so uplifting. And part of it is, is the video of you coming into the, the NBC had provided it, but it's you coming into the stadium. What did you feel seeing your teammate walk into the stadium in, uh, in Beijing that day? Proud, um, because I know him personally. Um, I know he was standing up there watching him. He was a great representation of China. Couldn't have a better person. Um, you know, to, to think that watching this guy and there's a billion people that's behind him and, and rooting him on, um, you, you have to feel something. Yeah. I mean, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> you got to feel something. But, you know, um, no, nah, I, was, I was just proud watching my teammate up there in the Olympics uh, because I knew how much it meant, not only for him, but for, for China. You've both experienced playing in a foreign country, 
obviously you playing here, Tracy, you playing in China for, for Qingdao, mm -hmm. right? Qingdao, very cold. Very cold? Very cold. <laughs> very, very, very cold. Beautiful city, though, but very cold. What were some of the obstacles that you faced, and were they unique to a Chinese in America and an American in China? Uh, it's basketball. I think, you know, just really adapting to a different game. Um, again, you know, all my Chinese players, they, they spoke Mandarin, they spoke Chinese. I didn't speak any Chinese. So, but I did pick up, you know, a few basketball terminologies as I, I went on through that season. Um, like what basketball terminology did you pick up in I, Chinese? I, I picked up like how to um, tell my, my teammates to rebound. Um, you know, I always think I get fouled when I go to the hole, so I, I know Fanguilla. Uh, yeah. Fangue. Fanguilla. <laughs> Fanguilla. <laughs> Talk to the ref, my Fanguilla. You know, so. <laughs> um, and yeah, rebound, lob and jaw. You know, like I, I, I've learned some terminology, but at that time for me, and this is, you know, this is why I really I appreciate and I always be indebted and love China. Like that, I consider China my second home. It was a time, like, we as basketball players, we love being celebrated. So in the NBA, when you're on top of your game, you're being celebrated by fans. And Yao has gotten this. I, I've, I've received this in my time of playing. When you're at the free throw line and you're having one of those, you know, amazing seasons, and you're, you're standing at the free throw line, you got 18 to 20,000 people chin MVP, right? Like, that, I can't tell you how that feels. It's an amazing feeling when you're out there on the basketball court and there are other pros, but the MVP chants are for you individually. So by this time of me going to China, I wasn't the same player because I've, I've dealt with injuries. So those chants and everything, the last four years of my career had died down. <laughs> going to China, when the, the day that I announced that I was playing in the CBA, sold the CBA out. And my very first game, I, when I tell you it brought that energy, that love, that passion back, which I've lost for like four years, China brought that back. It like revitalized my career and my love for the game of basketball. So I'm always in there. Now, c cultural differences that you experienced in Houston. Cultural differences, you you know, being Chinese and suddenly being in Texas playing basketball <laughs> must have been a pretty big shock. Well, food, because he loved to eat. <laughs> I noticed, having spent the last two <laughs> days with him, he does love to eat. First of all, uh, in China, we don't have American football. You know, that's what, one of the most popular sports in Texas. And you have to watch it, some of those. Right? Uh, secondly, that, well, everything is bigger in Texas, that's for sure. And you just added to it. <laughs> <laughs> that's for sure. And uh, you know, everything is so um, far away in Texas because of the landscape is too, so big. You know, I, I, my, my, my hometown is in Shanghai. It's a, it's a, it's There's a, 20 million people in your hometown. Yeah. So um, that, it's far away in China as well. No? I mean, like in China, I mean in Shanghai. Shanghai. Well, that's 25 million people. All right, 25 uh, million people. And um, so I'm not, it's, it's almost like you live in, uh, living in the city, like in Houston, that when I heard a neighborhood, how far is that? I said, no, 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 not far, like 45 minutes drive. Okay, that's not far, so how far is far? <laughs> you got a point. Yeah, the population density is, is a little different from Shanghai. Yeah, for sure. To say the least. Did playing basketball kind of help you, Tracy, adjust to kind of life in China? In other words, did it, was it really the lever that got you involved and made no, you? No, no, you got to understand, um, this is... 2013, I think, when I played in China. I've been going to China since 1998. Mm -hmm. So I'm very familiar of the culture. Um, it's, I'm, I'm right at home. 
Actually, I just got back from China two weeks ago. So when I go to China, what, what were you I, doing I, there two weeks ago? I, you know, I went to the Asian Games. Uh, I was over there with Yao. We saw the Chinese national team win the championship. That was amazing. Um, but I, I just visiting my partners, and um, you know, that's the, the beauty about China. You know, um, not being celebrated in the NBA for so many years, and you know. You, you kind of lose your, your mojo and your, your, your deals go away, not with China. Like it, it, that, that really doesn't matter. It's you know, who you are as a, as, a, as a player, who you are as a, as a person is really what matters. And I've established some you know, uh, long life partnerships and friendships um, since I've been going. Yeah. Wow. You're my you, friend? You have lifetime partnerships here, yeah? Mm -hmm. Do you have lifetime, like Tracy has with Chinese, do you have them with Americans? Well, besides Tracy, I have a lot of friends, still have a lot of friends here. Um, um, I have some friends in Houston, still living in Houston. And my daughter is born in Houston. Um, let's start to say about the you company. Know, how tall is she? How tall is your daughter? I mean, your, your, your um, mother, I know, was, was yeah, it's quite a tall. 185 centimeter. I'm not sure how, how much inches. 185? One yeah. meter 85? You know what's funny? I actually go to China, more to China, than he comes to the States. Can you? You don't love us no more, y'all? <laughs> no, I'm joking. He hasn't been, you haven't been here in four years, right? Yeah. You gotta get, that, you gotta get he's, you know, he's ahead of Chinese basketball. When you're in China, are you recognized on the street? Y'all want to answer that for Steve? All right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I. I am. I. I built up a pretty big following in China. Ha having spent the last two days with Yao, he is recognized on the street here. Yao I mean, it, is recognized it's, anywhere. It's. 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 <clears throat> it's remarkable. I mean, there. There. Not many folks with the level of recognition that, that no, you have. No, and a great human being at that, though. We got some young people in the audience who want to have international basketball careers. What would you tell them? What would you tell both Chinese and Americans who are interested in basketball? What should they, they want to be stars, what should they do? Well, I, I grew up in a town in central Florida of 10,000 people. And you know, my surroundings of where I grew up, I grew up in a drug infested neighborhood and never in a million years <clears throat> would I have thought that I will have the opportunity to uh, have business in China, um, yet alone be, with, be friends with somebody like Yao um, as monumental and, you know, uh, inspiring as he is. But you now I've always been a curious kid, you know, um, when things happen in my neighborhood and I get wind of it, I'm the first one to run out of the house to see what's going on. Just been just that curiosity. But I think for those kids is just have those have the curiosity of wanting to learn. I mean, that's how you learn. That's how you, that's the growth and getting to know, um, you know, different cultures, food, um, you know, how they prepare for for the game of basketball, what we love dearly. Um, so for me, it's just you know, have that curiosity and, and, you know, I'm a prime example of that. China really has changed my life, changed my family's life um, with the extended version of, you know, the business opportunities. Um, so I, I would never, you know, waver from that. I always have that curiosity. I wanted to learn and, and, and learn more. Yeah, what do you want to tell young people? Uh, I agree with what Max said, uh, curiosity. Um, when people say uh, play basketball is for fun, and you have to love the basketball to play better, but uh, you know, the basketball we're bringing to um, a, a life trip that uh, it's a full of uh, full of interesting story that you have to be interest, you have to be curiosity about what you're going to meet in, in next steps, and I don't 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 be afraid to take the take the next steps. Always take the next one, and next one, and next one. Um, for that, you will meet your next teammate or opponent. Uh, you are you are going to next to the next 
going to the next level that you may getting better. Uh, you may go into the next, uh, next country um, to foreigner, whether European or Asia or in China or whatever. The, the curiosity will keep you going. Yeah. Is there another Yao Ming out there among the 1.4 billion Chinese? Are we going to see another Yao Ming, the, the person who brought really basketball to, to China, the NBA to China, who really had this remarkable impact? Is there one in the, well, in the junior leagues, so to speak? <laughs> we, um, we have a lot of talented kids. We have a lot of talented kids, but we just need uh, we just need to put more attention, uh, more more patience on them, and also pay more attention on them to to scout them, to help them to develop their talent. Into I think the sky's the limit. Here's a question which I don't think you've been asked before: the um, how can sports help rebuild? U.S.-China relations, which is what we've been talking, you know, we've been talking about how with the government relationship, the government-to-government -government relationship so deeply challenged, we've been talking about people-to-people -people relationships, rebuilding U.S.-China relations kind of from the bottom up. So my question for both of you is how can sports help do that? I think when, <clears throat> when countries come together, build that bridge of, of, of playing together. Uh, playing together uh, brings engagement. Uh, engagement brings connections. And those connections can lead to, you know, uh, partnerships, uh, friendships. And, um, you know, it's, 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 all, it's all about playing together. And uh, I think, oh, um, you know, if you look at, you know, myself, where I come from, my background, where Yao comes from, his background, but we all, we, we have that one thing in common, and that's that, that round ball and passion for it. And, you know, we truly love that, and it doesn't matter, you know, his religion, his belief, none of that really matters, but us just really putting our mind together for that common goal and trying to achieve that. And I think, you know, when we do that, you know, build those bridges and, and come and play together, it could solve any issue. Yeah, how can we rebuild? Well, so, uh, well, I would say that only through sports we can seek in sportsmanship. But sportsmanship is like, you know, when we, uh, we recognize that we are opponents on, on, on the basketball court or any sports field, but sometimes, I don't know if you, might, you agree with me. Sometimes we, we, um, we know a lot of best friends from doing our competition because we respect each other. I but don't fraternize. <laughs> I, don't fr I, don't, I don't fraternize. It, it could be my cousin. <laughs> if we about to play, I, I don't fraternize. <laughs> but go ahead. Okay. Um, so that when, when, you, when you play in your best level, you wish you have a proponent on a court that can match against you, that can push yourself into your limit. And that, that, now, only through your best opponent, you can find the best for yourself. And that is, I think we, when the game is over, when the game is over, then we result, result come, we still respect each other. Which is kind of what you could say about US-China relations going forward. <laughs> that we have to maintain that respect. We have to have rules of the road. Yeah. It should be great. Yeah. I want to thank the both of you. Now, what, what this, why this ball suddenly showed up what, was I would shoot it for the first time in 50 years now. The um, love you guys to each autograph it, and it will be kind of a memory of both this evening and of what sports diplomacy can do. As you know, we hosted the Chinese ping pong team in 1972, and we helped change the direction of U.S.-China relations. And in a lot of ways, basketball is the ping pong of 50 years ago, that the enthusiasm that Chinese have, mostly because of Yao and because of Tracy, 
the enthusiasm that Chinese have for basketball and the NBA helps bring the two countries together. Yeah, I mean, I mean I'm, I'm actually um, trying to do that in my own way. Um, so, you know, I'm real big on giving people an opportunity um, just based off of, you know, me sitting in this seat today. Someone gave me an opportunity uh, and gave me a platform to, to be able to make a name for myself. So I created a one-on-one -on -one basketball league to where because of my partnership with China, <clears throat> and I know how big and impactful basketball is in, in the country of China, I wanted to, um, to, to bring a platform that hasn't been built yet with, through one-on-one -on -one to give that opportunity for those players here in the United States that will probably never get the opportunity to go to China and play against the Chinese players and bring those Chinese players over as well. So I'm very heavily involved in the youth space and, and that's the bridge that I'm building to you know, uh, spark those relationships. So, yeah, I'll sign. Well, if everybody would join me in thanking Yao and Tracy for a wonderful discussion and for what they've done. Thank you both. Woo! Is a, dessert, a dessert reception in the back, I'm told. What we do, throw this in the crowd? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Oh, thank you, Steve. <laughs>